everything in life, especially in the workforce, is subjective, but especially art, art is one of the most subjective things. And, and finding a career in show business is also incredibly subjective. How do you define success mm -hmm. in, by that? Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of pressure. Welcome to Candid Insights. I'm your host, Sahel Badruddin, and today we have with us Hassan Minhaj, actor, comedian, and the host of the Netflix series, Patriot Act. I have heard you say comedy is like funny speech and debate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just curious about what uh, sparked your initial interest in comedy. Yeah, so when I was in college, I, I went to undergrad right around the time where, like, where universities were going from, you know, people at home had DSL, but, like, universities had, would have T3, super, super high-speed internet, and um, this is way pre-Netflix, but people would use things like Kazaa, LimeWire, and they would just <laughs> download everything. So it was the first time where, you know, I, I went to school at UC Davis where people would just torrent just backlogs mm. of everything. I have every episode of South Park. Oh, wow. I have every episode of King of the Hill. I have mm. every, every episode of The Simpsons. Um, I have every stand-up special from Comedy <laughs> Central, every half hour, every one hour. And so I ended up going into a friend's uh, dorm room, and he showed me stand-up. I, 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 I wasn't really familiar with the art form. Mm. And then when I was watching this special called Chris Rock's Never Scared, I was like, oh, this is funny speech and debate. He's mm -hmm. presenting an argument and just doing it in a funny way. Mm. Yeah. So the advice you've given to become a top comedian, and I think you got this from Conan O'Brien. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Move to the city that does what you want, immerse yourself in the community, yeah. rise among the ranks, and then be nice to everyone. Be it's nice, just, yeah, which is huge. But, you know, like many things, it's harder than it looks, uh -huh. especially when you're going through the process. Right, right. So I'm curious about what, what kept you motivated and driven when you were in that process. You know, you know what's really great about something like um, stand-up, which, so, which, so, which is a live performance... Um, medium mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's something that you do every night. There's a built-in community of open mics every night. Mm. So what I what what got what just kept me going was two things. Like number one, the community. Every night in the cities, you know, when I first started, it was Sacramento, then San Francisco, then Los Angeles, and then finally New York, where I live now. Every night there. Are, so many different open mics. Mm. And so I just, you know, set those little goals. Tonight, I'm going to go to the Brainwash Cafe, which was an open mic at a laundromat. Tonight, I'm going to go to, you mm -hmm. know, this open mic at a coffee shop. I'm going to go to this open mic. And I would just, the, those would be the little monkey bars that would get me through every day. Then the second part was just putting together jokes. I really looked like jokes as like puzzles. Mm. And then when you put together an act, that's like the puzzle coming together and you start to see it become something. So five minutes becomes seven minutes, seven minutes becomes 10 minutes, 10 minutes becomes 15 minutes, 20 minutes, so on and so forth. And then you start to put them away like these little blocks of material. So I became really obsessed with putting together these puzzles and then putting the puzzle together for like a whole thing. Mm. And as I continued to evolve in my career, I just kept going, where can I take this? Well, where can I take this? Where can I take this? So I went from just putting, seeing if I could put together jokes to construct an act, just a standard stand-up comedy act, to then putting together an hour, then from putting together an hour to being like, maybe there's, I want to go even deeper from just jokes. Maybe I can do storytelling, take storytelling and comedy, take that to Mm. Off Broadway. Let's see if I can do that as a you know just continuing to evolve. Okay. And um, I'm just, just continuing hustling. to try to yeah just e continuing to get better at the craft and evolving and see where I can take comedy. So besides skill, what do you feel are some of the biggest challenges new and upcoming comedians or artists face currently in America? Yeah, I think it's two things. Um, I would say like the number one pressure is especially for you know artists that you know grow up in communities like ours there is this huge pressure of like how do you define success in a in a career where there are there are really no guarantees mm -hmm. and look ev everything in everything in life especially in the workforce is subjective but especially art art is one of the most subjective things and, and finding a career in show business is also incredibly subjective how do you define success mm -hmm. in 
by that, you know, and there's, you know, sometimes people don't know how to define it for themselves. Sometimes they're defining it the way other people define it. Mm-hmm. I think that's a lot of pressure and something I struggled with when I was a young artist. Mm-hmm. You know, what does making it mean? And then the second sort of thing is while you're dealing with, you know, this sort of struggle, grind and climb, like how do you stay true to your own voice? And how do you find your voice mm. and cultivate that? And there is a little bit of like, you have to immerse yourself in the community, but you also have to like really get things to be really quiet and really think about, okay, what do I want to say and what do I want to share with the world? Yeah. You know, especially when you're coming up, you really want to be like your role models mm-hmm. and you really try to emul- emulate them. And then, you know, as you continue to evolve and grow, you start to realize look, I, there's only one me and I really have to refine and hone and find my own unique voice. Yeah. And that's something a little more personal as you hustled yeah. your way through yeah. this. Yeah. There were times, I, I know you've spoken publicly, where you've said your parents didn't always support you until you made it, right? Right, right, right. What advice would you give for the guy who's hustling, who's struggling? But, you know, there's certain hurdles in certain cultures, right? For example, there's less appreciation for arts or music or comedy as careers. Yeah. Like you said, there's no tangible metric right even advice on how to have that conversation with like parents and peers yeah i mean look there 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 does come a point i think for every artist where it's just you just have to burn the boats Mm -hmm. like it it really is it does come down to that where you just like have to rip the band-aid off and Mm -hmm. i remember that happened when my lsat score expired i had Mm -hmm. to have just like a really really just like rough conversation with my parents that was a real thing i had to go through and you know my parents their concern was just like it's not that we don't think that they care about you, you doing right? comedy is is a is, is a bad thing no it's we think you're very capable and we think that we just want everything to be okay we want your life to be okay we don't want you to struggle we don't want you to live on an air mattress and all that stuff and i think i came to a really important sort of conclusion for myself is i, I can only do things that i'm all in mm-hmm. for and I just really loved comedy that much. Mm-hmm. Honestly, like I, I had no problem sleeping on an air mattress and just having my yellow notepad and having the sh- my show that night. As long as you did what you loved. Yeah. And for me, I really re- realized making it was just, there was a moment where, look, there was gas in my car. I was able to, you know, I was able to go to Chipotle and get a burrito with <laughs> avocado. Yeah. You know, I, I could afford the extra dollar forty five mm. to like have guac. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, I had health care and I was doing what I loved. I'm like, this is it. This is making it. Mm. This moment, like where I'm at, if it, if it increases anymore, that's great. But this is making it. I'm, getting, I'm paying rent doing what I love. And this was pre-daily show, right? Pre-daily show. I just came to terms with it. I'm just like, look, people in the community think I'm a loser. I'm not funny. But I have a person who loves me, who is now my wife. Uh, I'm healthy and I yeah. do what I love. I, I At that point... You know, in, in you hit a certain age where you're just like, look, I, you know, I'm 28, 29. I really can't, I really can't entertain mm-hmm. trying to make you happy or try to convince you that, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm worthy of your appreciation or support. Mm. But you made a good point about at least you made the basic necessities and you made peace with that and then it still kicked off, right? Yeah. Like to me, it's just like, and look, like, especially in show business, so many people who, uh, who I look up to, the Jim Gaffigans, the John Stewarts, the Jerry Seinfelds, like they've all told me, like this concept of fame, it ebbs and flows. It mm-hmm. is not a constant. Mm-hmm. So there are going to be times where people are like, oh my God, you're selling out theaters. And there's times where people are like, eh, I'm not really into him anymore. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest inspirations for me was this comedian named Dick Gregory who passed mm-hmm. away. And mm-hmm. Dick Gregory is, was, it was, was one of the most famous, most prominent, both political comedians and African American comedians, who was just a real trailblazer, and, and he and he broke a lot of ground. He passed away in his 80s, but you know he's a legend. Every comedian respects him. I, I had this conversation where I was talking to another comedian friend of mine, and what was really amazing about Dick Gregory is he was playing Caroline's Comedy Club, which is a comedy club which mm. seats you know maybe 300 or less, right? He is a he is an icon, but he still had dates on the books before his death. And I remember, you know, my friend and I, Roy was Jr. Yeah. In his 80s. Yeah. And and he was like, man, Dick Gregory has dates on the books when, when he died. And wow. that's incredible. That's incredible to me. Yeah. And so that is how I define success. And I, you know, I, I really encourage other artists to define it that way too. What kind of comedy do you feel still has a lot of white space and space for growth? I think 
political comedy specifically, like I'm really excited about the space that Patriot Act can live in. Hmm. I think for the longest time, especially when it comes to news and political news, we've either been spoken for or spoken to. It's one of those right. two things. And when you think about sort of headline pieces that shape our life or shape our our identity, um, there's just so much in the American political satire space that hasn't addressed things like the United States' relationship with Saudi Arabia, uh, the, the rise of nationalism in India, um, Brexit, like these huge, huge global topics, mm -hmm. uh, uh, elections in Venezuela, these huge topics that are affecting hundreds of millions of people. Right. And on the Patriot Act offices at in, in our offices in New York, on my whiteboard in my office, there's this big thing where, because I get asked all the time, well, where, what space does this show live in? It says 6.4B and it's mm -hmm. underlined. And um, my co-writer and co-creator of the show, Prashant, uh, he came into my office early on when we were in pre-production and, and he wrote that on my, on my whiteboard. And he says there's 6.4 billion people in the world with melanin. Hmm. So wow. this cognitive framework of, hey, where is this show going to fit? Who is it going to speak to? There's more people who look like me than don't. Right. So, in fact, the conversation should be towards any other late night host. How are you going to relate to those 6.4 billion people who don't immediately share your frame of reference or reference or way of life or understanding or perception yeah. of the world? Which That's the white space I, I think it's going to be really interesting. And it's actually not the white space, it's the brown space. Yeah. <laughs> but then how do we prop these people up? How do we encourage them to see that they can make it and... We have such a diverse group in the world. But yeah, still, totally. But aren't, but don't you think we're seeing it right now? Yeah, I think yeah. it's the rise of it. Yeah, I yeah. think, and I think it's awesome. I think it's it's every per it's every seat that's filled at every show. It's every retweet. It's every like on Instagram. It's every time people sit down and watch and share these videos. It's spreading and it's inspiring people. And I'm really excited to see like I just see the breadth of talent. Yeah. You've mentioned that in the next 15 years of entertainment will include more female voices, especially oh, 100% brown and 100% Muslim. Yes, I, I can and I cannot wait to see. How do we? That's going to be really cool. Yeah, how do we help create that better environment for to see these? Is it already happening or? Yeah, I just think like I think the biggest thing, the the biggest thing that you know, new voices um, and especially voices from, you know diverse different communities that we, we haven't heard from, whether it's women of color, or people from the LBGTQ community. I, I think the, the biggest thing that like, you know, they need, you know, the, every, we all need is just space. Mm -hmm. They need to be included in these, in, in like the bills on comedy shows or in the writer's room. And having inclusion that way gives them an opportunity to shine. Mm -hmm. And my biggest thing is like a dude is to just get out of the way and let them share their stories and be great. That, yeah. that, that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned. Mm -hmm. And to be, do everything that I can to, clear, to, to make space, listen, and contribute. So going back, there's, there's a tendency, especially when performing comedy, to use like self-deprecating humor. Okay. For example, for South Asians, people use like Indian accents. Right, like right, right. The right. Apu syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah. How do we go beyond that? Yeah, like to me, it's uh, are you laughing like at me or with me? Mm -hmm. So like the you know the way like you know a common trope in in all mm -hmm. forms of comedy is high class, low class. Mm -hmm. So like there, you have the protagonist and the joke, um, and something is happening to the protagonist. Some outside external factor outside of the race hmm. is happening to them that or maybe because of their race but there is something that is happening to them that where they they are the victim of circumstances and we've all felt that you know you're walking on the road all of a sudden you know <laughs> bird poop lands on your shoulder we've, <laughs> we've felt those those yeah. moments before right right or you're you know you feel like you're walking in into a door and it's not a door and it's just a window and you face plant. Like, mm -hmm. why are those things funny? It's, and I think it's because people find it funny that, hey, you, like, you were embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Because I think we've all felt that way before. Right. Um, so my thing is, is that like, I want to tap into the human condition mm -hmm. and I'm totally okay with like self-deprecating humor as long as it's tapped into that. Mm -hmm. And it's not linked to just something where, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna just laugh at a stereotype. But I feel like some of these racial and ethnic stereotypes sometimes amplify them rather than. Do you think it's getting worse? No, I think it's been the same. Uh, oh, really? Like it's, it's 
sort of stayed the same since like even the 90s? They're still. I think it may be getting a little bit better because I think people are recognizing it more. I mean, the Apu syndrome. There was a whole. I think I'm sure you saw the right? documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Documentary, right. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's been more recognition of it. Yeah. But you're saying are you using it in the positive sense versus the yeah or ju- you know? or yeah just you know like how do I just tap into the the everyday human condition that everyone knows and feels mm-hmm. you know those those common emotions of like pain love loss anxiety fear uh, embarrassment like yeah. those are things we the all human feel condition yeah right? the that's human it. feelings yeah. I, I believe there are young people in the South Asian Muslim community who, uh-huh. who look up to you as a role model. Uh-huh. Uh, what kind of responsibility now do you feel, like compared to many years ago, of defining yourself as part of an identity? Do you feel responsibility? Do you feel like you can give lessons to that as people do look up to you? I definitely, you know, I definitely feel like super humbled that people would consider me to be somebody that they would you know, look up to and, and, and admire and all that stuff. It's definitely a lot of pressure. Yeah. And there's definitely feelings of, hey, you can't mess up because people mm-hmm. people are watching, people are looking at you, you know, and people people maybe turn to you. Um, and great power I, comes great responsibility. Yeah, but, you know, I talked to John Stewart about this, mm-hmm. and I was like, how do you deal with stuff like this? Yeah. And he said, look, like, uh, make no mistake, there is no one song, movie, or joke that will change the world. It is my job at the show to, to do the best possible work that I can, mm-hmm. and perhaps that that provides some clarity or some respite, mm-hmm. some relief to your life. Yeah, That's it. But the real change, the necessary condition for change, actually doesn't come from us mm-hmm. artists. It actually comes from action in the streets. Mm-hmm. Like people actually enacting changes in Congress mm-hmm. with their senator, marching, voting. Those are necessary conditions to change. Right. Not a joke. At best, what we do is we we strike a lightning bolt of inspiration that like gets people to possibly do something. But mm. again, it's a sufficient condition, not a necessary not, not a necessary condition. Yeah. So we're living in this post truth, post fact yeah. world yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Uh, do you see comedy as breaking through and breaking echo chambers, breaking through some of these views and perspectives. Right. You know, look, like, I think, you know, we're, yeah, we're living in a time where, like, reality itself is up for grabs and it's really scary and terrifying. Mm-hmm. But the closest thing that I, I can see to trying to sort of figure that out is to hit people in both places, sort of hearts and minds. It's why, like, with some of our act structure that you saw tonight, there's mm-hmm. stats and there's values. Mm-hmm. And I acknowledge that. It's like, hey, look, I'm, I'm showing you all this stuff, but it doesn't matter. I'm giving you a rational argument to an irrational, irrational fear. Thing. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. That, that means nothing. We've all argued with people on Facebook. Yeah. It's not going to, it's, it's not an gonna, emotional it's not gonna thing. Work. It's an emotional thing. So that's why I do both. I'm, mm-hmm. I, I want to address both. Mm-hmm. The values part, the heart part. Hey, I just feel this way. Mm-hmm. This is just what I feel. And then also hit you with, with the head stuff. Right. And I think comedy gets the mixture rather than hopefully. The, a lecture, Hope, right? Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. Right. But look, at the end of the day, like, if if someone doesn't want to change, they they can't. Again, like all I can do is just do the best possible work that I can. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes people are just like, "Well, comedians, why can't you solve this all?" And mm-hmm. it's like, "Hey, man, we're all doing our part." Mm-hmm. Like, and I think just if, if, as artists, if we as artists or politicians or journalists, if we all do the best possible work we can, hopefully it moves the needle forward. It's collective. Yeah, it's like collective. yeah. yeah. So finally, you've been doing this North American tour, and then yeah. you have your Netflix yeah. series coming yeah. up, Patriot yeah. Act. Yeah. Five years ago or six years sure. ago, did you imagine you'd be doing this? Wow. Um, no, I didn't imagine that I would be here. Yeah. But I remember about five or six years ago, I just became, you know, that's probably, that's what, 2013? I was, you know, doing videos called The Truth with Hassan Minaj, and I was part of a sketch group called Goatface, and mm-hmm. I was doing stand-up and starting to get involved in the storytelling community, the Moth mm. Storytelling Hour, I was just looking at the next monkey bar ahead of me. Mm. That's all I was doing, was making the best possible stuff that I could. Mm. And um, Is it different now? Yeah. You know, you, you got to see the monkey bar tonight. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's refining that and finessing that. Mm-hmm. And it's getting ready for, you know, our final show of the tour, which is October 18th at Carnegie Hall, and then October 28th, the series drops. Yeah, congrats. And, the, and I'm really... You know, I just, I, you know, we're putting those headlines together for the series, and that's it. 
beyond that, it's out of my control. It's just <laughs> yeah, it's you just do your doing thing, the best possible right? work. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to today's episode with Candid Insights. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe or follow us on social media for updates on future episodes. If you've already subscribed, please leave us a rating or review. It does help new people find the podcast. I'm Sahil Badruddin, your host. And for a transcript of this interview and others, visit my website at sahilbadruddin.com. <laughs>